So it's coming. This is going to be the C++ tutorial series. I just wanted to give a forenote here and say that I wasn't really sure if I wanted to do this series or not simply because explaining C++ over a series of a couple YouTube videos is not an easy challenge. And I'm still not 100% satisfied with this series. Um, I think I could have done a little bit of a better job. Um, but I wanted to at least get my thoughts out there because someday I might do something crazy like actually try to write a book on this subject or something. So um, I figured I should at least upload the series because I know some of you out there might get something out of it. Um, and I hope to improve upon these tutorial type videos in the future. So you can kind of consider this a dry run if you will. Um, as usual though, if you enjoy these videos, uh, please comment and like on them. and. Uh, you know, if, if you find something that you thought wasn't explained all that great, you know, give me a comment as well, and uh, I'll, I'll use that to improve on it. So, thanks guys. Here comes the series, and enjoy. This is going to be the C++ series. One of the reasons why I was so reluctant to do this, and I'm still not sure, is C++ compared to C is a very, very complicated programming language, or I should say complex. Um, C is one of those languages where if you spend enough time at it, you can learn it pretty quickly, you know, in, in the order of months. Where C++, you can pick up that fast, but in order to master it, you're really going to be at it for, for somewhere in the order of many years. I've been working in C++ for uh, well over 10 years now, and there's still things about it that I, I learn and, and tricks that I pick up that, um, that I, I didn't even use even a few years ago. Um, so I'd like to impart some of that knowledge to you guys in a multi-part YouTube series. Um, Disclaimer is always, uh, it's not always the most optimal way to learn how to program by watching videos. Uh, programming is a participation sport, not a uh, spectator sport. But um, I always find that material like this, especially in video form, is scarce across the internet. And every little bit helps, especially when you're starting out. So I'm just going to... You know, just as I usually do, I'm going to talk about con concepts first, and then I'm going to go into some more concrete things as, as the series progresses. So just as an introduction, uh, what are some of the advantages of learning C++ nowadays? Um, well, for starters, it's very performant. Um, basically, all the performance you get in a low-level language such as C is also there in C++. The amount of overhead that's brought in by some of the higher-level um, features that are added into C++ from C are still very performant if you were to compare them to some of the real high-level languages like Java and C Sharp and, and even higher-level scripting languages like JS. Uh, so the performance is there. Um, it's object-oriented, so it's, it's one of the first languages that introduced the, uh, the idea of classes and objects into the programming paradigm so that it helps you keep your code um, organized and, and uh, separate in, into it, little encapsulated objects, so that's very important. Um, it's organized, like I was just saying. So um, it's a way for keeping extremely complex, very large code bases from kind of exploding into themselves and, and becoming very confusing and disorganized. C++ code is a way to keep your stuff very modularized and very separate um, from, from other components, which is very useful. Um, it's an industry standard, so um, nowadays if you were to go on job listings and look up jobs in, in the computer science industry, there are still tons of C++ jobs out there uh, simply for the reason of the previous three things I mentioned. Um, so that's important. It's portable. So if, if we were to talk about some of the concepts I mentioned already, um, other high-level languages like Java will hit on a lot of these. Java is also object-oriented, it's also organized, and it's also an industry standard but it misses out on performant. Um, if I was to pick something like Objective-C or um, C-sharp, the portability is there, but it's in question, especially in the Objective-C side, um, with the exception of Visual Studio 2015 attempting to add support for it. So basically, C++ is the most portable, low-level performant code uh, option that you're going to be able to find, with the exception of um, C. So. Um, all these things together at the same time is one of, the, one of the primary reasons why I feel like learning C++ is still important nowadays. Um, moving right along. Oh, it's, it's backwards compatible, which is important as well. Um, many other high-level languages like Java and C Sharp and some of the other ones, um, there's no way they're backwards compatible with C. If you try to write your familiar C code, if you come from a C background, 
um, you will find that that code won't work anymore, but then have to be rewritten. Um, one of the advantages to C++ is 90% of your C code will just run unmodified if you were to just paste it right in. So backwards compatibility with a high performance language like C, uh, which can even in some cases beat C++ by, by a slim margin, that code will still run in C++ code base, which is huge. Um, so that's very important. So what are the starting points here? Where, sh where should you be if you're watching this video, and where should you go if you haven't uh, hit these starting points yet? Well, for starters, um, I feel like it is very, very critical and, and uh, imperative to know the C language, or at least know a reasonable level of understanding of the C language before trying to learn C++. A lot of people um, don't agree with this. If you go get a computer science bachelor's degree right now, they'll try to start you in C++ right away. I really think that's a mistake. It's a way to get yourself overwhelmed, confused. You can even pick up bad habits or beliefs that will stick with you throughout your entire career. It's a big mistake. Um, lucky for you guys, if you don't know C, um, right on the same YouTube channel, I have a multi-part series that takes you from complete novice to uh, understanding C in the course of about 15 videos. I highly recommend you start there if you haven't. Um, before watching this series. Um, other starting points. Java language or C-sharp, if you maybe want to go backwards or down to C++ from those languages, that's fine. Um, I still recommend if you don't know C, you still go all the way back to C and go forward, but you might not have as much trouble. But things like pointers are going to come up and then you're going to get a little lost, and I cover pointers pretty well in the, in the C series. So um, those are the starting points. Um, this is the slide that might overwhelm you guys, um, but like I said, C++ is a very complicated language, um, but I want to at least get myself organized and let you guys know what you're in for. So this is all the things I plan to cover in this series. Um, first off, I'm going to cover the old and the new standards together. Um, C++ 11, which is still a rather new standard, came out just a few years ago. It is way better in almost every way than the original C++ in in, in with respect to some of the things you can do in it. Nobody really prefers to write in the old C++ anymore. There's really no reason to teach it separately, so I'm covering them both together um, so that you guys can learn the latest there is. Uh, when I say C++11, I sort of mean C++14 too, but C++14 added so few things that it's, I really just think of it as C++11 still. So at the very first, I'm going to cover the types, what new data types have been added in C++11, or at least the important ones. I'm going to cover function overloading, um, so that's something I'm going to get into. Um, one of the biggest things I'm going to get into is the concept of classes that have been added to C++, uh, object -oriented and, and, and object-oriented programming, which they accomplish. Uh, I'm going to cover conce concepts of encapsulation, the constructor-destructor, what inheritance is, how it works, polymorphic inheritance, uh, inheritance, which is a ridiculous buzzword, which basically just means um, abstraction. I'm going to cover operator overloading, which is a very awesome feature of C++. I'm going to uh, get, provide some examples of that. I'm going to provide examples of copy construction and how that works and how you can get in trouble with it. Implicit class conversions and how you can do some really wild looking stuff uh, with classes and, and make your code look and read um, as intended without adding a lot of complexity. Um, special pointer casts, I'm going to cover that. I'm going to cover dynamic memory changes and differences from C to C++, uh, namely via the new and delete operators that have been added. I'm going to cover templates. Um, templates alone is, is one of the most complicated facets of C++, but I'm definitely going to at least cover those. I'm going to cover what data structures are and how they help you and how to accomplish using them properly via the SDL. I'm going to cover shared and unique pointers and what those are and how those can help you. I'm going to cover lambda functions, which is just a fancy name sort of for local functions and how those um, come into play. And um, that essentially is it. Um, however, um, because you're watching this on my YouTube channel and not someone else's, um, kind of my take on everything is this is all going to be with applications to graphics because I'm a game programmer. So at some point throughout this series, I'm going to start... Um, doing what I usually do, which is applying this stuff to maybe a small game example or at least some form of a graphics example. Um, all right, so that's a lot. I know it's very overwhelming. Uh, like I said, C++ is not a simple language, but at the very least, by the end of this entire series, you will at least have a basic understanding of all these concepts. And because C++ is insane with the amount of stuff you can do with it, I'm sure there's something I left out here. And you know what? I'm going to add that in as, as I think about it, too. So this is going to be how this series starts.
So in keeping with the spirit of the original C series, I figured the best place to start with um, a dive into C++ from, you know, only learning C is to cover at least some of the very basic things that have changed. Um, C++ is extremely overwhelming, so if you try to dive in and I try to teach you everything at once, I'll probably overwhelm you guys. So what I'd like to do is just talk about at the lowest level what's been changed and basically cover some of the data types. So um, I'm going to walk you through a subset of them. There's no way I can go over all the stuff that's been added, but I'm going to cover some of the basic, most primitive types that have been added. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is Booleans. So um, Booleans are very um, self-explanatory with, within the realm of programming, and it's kind of funny that C never really had an actual bool type. So in C, it was very common for somebody to, to do something like, um, say, integer b equals zero if it's false, and then, you know, uh, one if it's true. And then usually they would pound define true as, as one and false as zero. Well, C++ just added that as a, uh, as a Boolean, as a Boolean um, type, which could be true or false. So those are Booleans. Um, they also added um, typed um, integers. So basically now you can do, um, instead of assuming that int is four bytes and short is two bytes and hoping that the C standard, um, you know, is what you were expecting it to do or follow, um, you can now use these very specific types um, to pretty much assert that um, you are getting yourself, you know, a, uh, a an integer that you would expect. So, for example, if I wanted a um, signed 8-bit integer, which uh, in C maybe you would use a, a char for, you can basically say, well, I want um, int 8t, and that... Um, that tells me that I, I basically have a signed int uh, integer. So it's basically you or, 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 or not you for, for unsigned or, or signed the type, which is int, 8, which is the number of bits, and then t. So it's uh, it's very simple. So um, those have been added to C++. They're pretty awesome because in the past people would do things like this and they wouldn't be standard, and now they're there. They're a standard. Um, also added to C++, assuming you include it, and I'll explain how this works later uh, when I get in the classes, but there's actually a string type. So instead of having to do this, which of course still works in C++, um, you can now basically say string, and you could do the same thing. And this thing is uh, considerably more um, powerful than a, um, than a C++ string as far as that. It has a lot of nice convenient things that are built in. So those are uh, C++ strings and they're awesome. Um, the last thing I'm going to cover um, when I talk about types um, as far as things that have been added to C++ um, would be the auto type which is not really a type. It's basically called type inference and what this allows you to do is infer what the variable should be based off of what you set it equal to. So, for example, if I set this equal to um, a float literal, then the compiler will see this as float. If I set this equal to an integer, the compiler might see it as int. If I set it equal to something very specific, like a double cast um, of a float, then the compiler would see this as double, or if I just took the f off here. So, it's, it's a way of... of um, it's a way of not having to type out very long expressions or, or very long variable types in cases where you know what the return value is going to be and the compiler should just assume it. So for example, if you had a ridiculously long type here like this would make more sense when I start covering C++ uh, classes, but just for the sake of argument here, if you had a function that returns something like this, um, before before C++ and before C++ 11, you would have to do something like this to call the function, which was really annoying. And what auto allowed you to do is basically infer that type and replace it with with auto in that case. So uh, I could almost spend you know an hour talking just about all the power behind something like auto and, and, and type inference. But for now, I just like I said, this is a very very brief introductory intro, introduction video, so I don't want to harp too much on it. So there, there's type inference, um, and we're going to go ahead and stop here, and we're going to start really diving into C++ in the next video. So get ready.